Hi, Gary Chillingworth here for Airgun Magazine Shooting and Country TV. Welcome to Life at a Range. What we have here, apart from the mosquitoes, is a BSA Gold Star. Brilliant hunting rifle, great HFT rifle, great garden plinker, everything you'd ever want from a rifle. Adjustable cheek piece, adjustable butt pad, adjustable hamster, super accurate, great gun. Sitting on top is an Optus hand. 3 by 12 by 32 millimeter scope. The question okay. is, which is more important, the scope or the gum? Go away, mosquito. Well, strangely enough, my opinion is that the scope is more important than the rifle. Most modern, high quality rifles, your air arms, your vire arcs, your BSAs, will outshoot us all. They'll put pellet on pellet on pellet, day in, day out. But if you buy the wrong scope for the type of shooting that you want to do, you're not going to have a good time. So today we're going to have a good look at some optics and we're going to see what's best for you. Welcome to life at once again the mosquito infected range. Okay, so first of all, just let's look at the anatomy of a telescopic sight. We're not going to look at the internals, we're just going to look at the basics of, of what you see in front of you. This is an Optisan EVX 10x44. That means the 10 means it's a fixed magnification. There's no adjustability. This is the Optisan CP. This is a variable mag from 3 to 12. But for the moment, we'll look at this with a fixed 10. Now, it's made up of a tube to start with that connects the two lenses. These often come in either 30 millimeter or 25 millimeter. Over here you have the ocular lens, ocular because it's like your eye, it's closest to your eye, so that's ocular, and here we have the objective. Now on this scope the objective is 44 millimeters, on this MTC it's 60 millimeters, and on this little Optisan it's 32 millimeters. But we'll come back to the difference and the advantages of different sizes in a minute. So this is our 10 by 44 we've got the ocular lens, we've got the tube, we've got the objective lens. Obviously with inside we've got a reticule, which could be a 30-30 ret, which is your standard crosshairs. We could have a multi a point ret, like this on a piece of glass, which has got your mill dots. Or you could have slashes or half mill dots. So there's lots of different rets out, you, uh, out there. My favourite is the, I think it's the MH10 from Optisan. That's the one that I shoot with. Now, on this scope, on the top, you have your elevation turret, which will make your aim points go up and down. And on the right-hand side, you have your windage, which will mean it will go to side to side. And on your side, you have your parallax. Now, parallax is one of the things that I get asked about the most. Um, what is parallax? Or more importantly, what is parallax error? Well, the easiest way I've ever found to describe it is if you pick a point on the wall and you put your thumb out in front of you, Close one eye and you block that thing you're looking at with your thumb. Now move your head and you'll see if you go left, your thumb will go right. And if you go right, your thumb will go left. Your thumb's in the same place and the thing uh, that you're looking at is in the same place. The only thing that's moving is your head. Now, when you're looking through a telescopic sight, if you're absolutely perfectly central, that's fine. But if you're doing an upward shot or a downward shot, or you're leaning up against a tree, your head might be fractionally off, and that can cause you to miss. Now, on a scope like this, you can set the parallax. From here, you've got any everything down to 10 yards up to 100 yards. Now, most people, if you're shooting HFT, will set it at about 25 to 30 yards, and that takes this error out. But actually getting your head absolutely central in the scope is incredibly important. But that essentially is parallax error. And we'll go more into that on a later video and how to actually the advantages of like a raised cheek piece and things like that to lock your head in place. But that is essentially what you have on your scope. Um, we're gonna get the only other thing that I did forget to put into the video, because I'm getting old and slightly senile, is most scopes will have a fast focus at the back. And as you can see, it winds in and out. Now, I'll be honest with you, I forgot about it because I never ever use it because I'm a little bit long-sighted. 
and these are designed to make sure your reticule is perfectly crisp. So if you've got slightly dodgy eyes, if, if you're short-sighted, whatever, and you don't want to shoot with your glasses on, you can use your fast focus and you can adjust like that so that reticule is always crisp and good. Um, by the way, this is a discovery scope. It's at uh, the budget end of the market. Tell you what, it's actually a cracking little scope. Objective lenses. Why should we buy a 60 millimeter objective over a 32 millimeter? Surely bigger is better. I'm now going to pass you over to a fat man in a conservatory who will explain what it's all about. Okay, so as you can see in front of us, we've got a scope with a 60 millimeter objective lens. We've got a scope with a 44 millimeter objective lens, and we've got a scope with a 32 millimeter objective lens. Also, this scope is from three times to 12 times magnification. This one is a fixed 10, and this one is everything up to 8 to 32 times magnification. Um, actually, a huge thanks to Richard Woods who loaned me this FT scope, as I am not an FT shooter. Um, I didn't have one, so he very kindly allowed me to borrow his. Now, why do we want a huge, great big objective as opposed to a small objective? Or why do we want a small as opposed to a large? Um, size isn't everything. Now, it comes down to what type of shooting you want to do. Now, the advantages of something like this is depth of field. Now, depth of field is when you're looking through your scope, let's say you set your scope to 10 times magnification, and you're sitting there and you look through your scope, and you'll be able to see all your targets from eight to 45, 50, 55 yards. Now, with this scope, which is the Optisans CP, which I think is one of the best scopes on the market, I love these, um, 15 yards to about 38 yards for me is crystal clear. Uh, from 38 yards to 45 yards, there is a fraction bit of blur, which is good because then where I can use that blur to judge some distance. And eight yards is quite blurry and I have to draw my head back a little bit like that to get a perfectly clear sight picture. So I know that if it's 15 yards or further and it's clear, I know rough distance. If I know it's under 15 yards, then I know from that kind of blur and the, the increasing blur you get what sort of distance away it is. So I can use that blur to range find. Now, this FT scope with this huge, great big objective yeah. lens. So I set my parallax at 30, and then I will be able to see the target between about 32 and 33 yards. Well, you're sitting there thinking, well, why is that any good? Well, what you do in field target is you have usually have a larger side wheel, which uh, the larger diameter means there's a bit more refinement. But you look through and you look at the target and you think, yeah, that's 35, 40 yards. So you set up to say 50 and then you start winding back, winding back, winding back, winding back. And then it comes into perfect clarity. You then read on the side wheel. don't know if you can make this out, but you've got distances. So you look on your side wheels. Ah, that's 34 yards. So you raise your turrets, you dial in 34 yards, put your crosshairs in the kill zone, bang, you kill your target. So something with a massive objective lens and high magnification, you can use for range finding. So like that, wind it in, and then you can shoot. Within HFT, once you've set your scope up, you're not allowed to touch it. You can't dial in the parallax, you can't adjust the turrets. You have to stick with what you've got. So you want that super long depth of field so that you can see every target from 8 to 45 yards. This is no good for you if you are shooting HFT. You can shoot FT with one of these, but you can't dial in. You have to do everything by eye. So that is the main advantage between a large objective lens and also a small objective left lens. Do we go for a 32 millimeter objective lens or do we go for a 44 millimeter objective lens? Do we go for a fixed 10, 10 times fixed, 10 times magnification or a variable mag? Well, bigger the lens will draw in more light. So if you're shooting in deepest, darkest woodland, 
maybe a slightly bigger lens, a 44 millimeter will be good for you. But then again, that often comes down to the coatings that the all optics have. All I can say to you is my Optisan 32 millimeter is as good as any 44 millimeter scope I've ever had for light gathering. It comes down to the technology of the scope. That's why it's so important for you to go to a gun shop and look through your scope. Lots of people will tell you many different things. If you go on the internet and you ask for advice on a scope, like what I'm doing now, people will tell you what they've got. Now, for me, I've been shooting competitively for 15 years. Um, I shoot to a good level, and I've tried lots of different scopes. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I like the Optus hands. I've had great MTCs. Uh, I had a beautiful Cytron Series 3, um, which was an amazing scope. Um, the best I ever, you know, I've, uh, I had the Hawk TAC 30, which I used and got me into the England squad. Brilliant scope. A lot of other people said that scope was rubbish. I completely disagreed. I loved it. One of the best scopes I ever owned because it worked for me. And this is the thing. You've got to find something that works for you. As long as it doesn't have a lot of parallax error, and as long as it holds zero, if you're able to throw lead down range and get it accurately, then that's the right scope for you. Do you have a fixed 10 or do you go for a variable mag? Well, a fixed 10 will have one less lens. So one less lens to maybe, maybe, maybe be ground slightly odd or, or whatever. Um, all my competition scopes are usually fixed tens. You know, I'll be honest with you, I very rarely use a variable mag. But if you're a hunter and you want the ability to change the magnification as long as you remember it affects your aim points, then that's fine. But certainly don't be scared of a fixed ten and certainly don't be scared of a variable mag. A question I get asked a lot is what's the difference between a hunting scope and a target scope? I'll say that's a very quiet rifle. Um, well, be honest with you, if you want to go hunting, you're only going to be hunting out to 40, 45 yards maximum with a sub 12 foot pound air rifle. Um, I wouldn't even, personally, I wouldn't even hunt at that distance. So any target scope that you can shoot accurately with, you can hunt with. However, some people like to use a scope where they can adjust the magnification so they can use, say, three times magnification to scan the area, and then when they lock into whatever they want to shoot, they wind it up to 10 or 12 mag, or in this case, with this Hawk first focal plane scope, 16 times magnification. The problem is, with a second focal plane scope, as I will explain in a minute, or at least him in the conservatory will, if you change the magnifications on a second focal plane scope, it will change your aim points. But the first focal plane, the aim points will always remain the same. This is our target, our nice little rabbit. And this is our reticule, which we'll place on top, just there, as you can see. Now, if you have a first focal plane scope, that is on, let's say, 10 times magnification. Then as you wind the magnification out, and it goes to three times, and you go back, you'll see that this crosshair stays relative to where you're aiming on the target. It will never change. All that will happen is the whole picture, including the reticule, will get smaller or it will get bigger. With a second focal plane, this stays the same. And the only thing that when you wind in and out is that gets smaller or that gets larger. The main advantage with the first focal plane is that no matter where you are, this crosshair or whatever dots you're using will stay the same. So if you, that is your crosshair for, say, 30 yards, and your rabbit is at 30 yards, you can wind it all the way in, and that will stay 30 yards. That crosshair will always be 30 yards. That will always be 30 yards. With a second focal plane, as you move away, you will see that that changes. So the 30 yard mark, which is there at 10 times magnification, 
If it's a three times magnification, it might be the first dot up there. So essentially, you need to have a separate set of aim points for every magnification you have. That's the disadvantage with second focal plane. Uh, I like the idea of once I've set my scope up, I, I never change it. Um, I have different aim points, which I can work out, but I don't need to wind the magnification in or out. But if you're going to go out hunting and you want to look through your scope and have it on low mag so that you can scan the area, and then when you dial in on a, a rabbit or a target, whatever, and you want to increase the magnification so you can do a pinpoint shot, then first focal plane is for you. Eye relief isn't actually that complicated. It's predominantly where your eye goes to get perfect alignment within your scope. Um, there are two sorts of scope. You've got uh, things like the MTC Connect and the Hawk Touch. Now, they have what they call a zero eye relief. Um, I don't actually have one of those here, I'm afraid. But essentially, you put your eye right up to the scope. Now, that's good. That almost takes parallax error out because when you're looking through, you can almost rest it on the bridge of your nose and you get that perfect alignment. Um, this one is a standard uh, eye relief, which is usually somewhere between three and four inches. This one's three and a half inches. So obviously you come back three and a half inches and you look through. Now, when you're putting this onto a rifle, um, a good trick that I was taught once is when you look through your scope and you bring your eye back, just pull your eye in Keep on going in, keep on going in, keep on going in, keep on going in. And then you will see a black circle that will arrive. That means your eye is fractionally too close. Now, you can set it up either with your eye drawn slightly back so that you no longer see the black circle. Or you could have that black circle permanently in your scope. And when you look through your scope, if that black circle is absolutely central, then you will know that your head is perfectly aligned with that scope. The advantage with going into a gun shop is you get to look through your scope. Now, a couple of little things to look out for. If you walk into a gun shop and you ask them, oh, can I have a look at that Optisan CP? They will often give it to you straight out of the box and it will be set on three times magnification and the parallax will be set at 20, and you look through and you go, wow, that's amazing. It's got a great depth of field because it's set on three times magnification. Because you're in a gun shop and you're looking at things that are really close, everything will be great. What you need to do is wind it up to 10 times magnification, and if they'll let you, look out the window. Look at a close car, look at a roof, um, look at something that's a distance away. It's a good idea also to maybe walk when you're walking into the gun shop, if there's a blue car part there, take a couple of steps, measure that. Okay, that bumper's eight yards. So that you know that what you're looking at is eight yards. And you know that the front of the car is 13 yards. And you know roughly over there, that's 40 yards. So that it will give you a true idea. So when you say, yes, I'll, I'll take that one, and they bring it out. They say, oh, don't worry, we won't, we'll give you a brand new one in a box. And you go, oh, that's absolutely lovely. And when that comes out, before you give them the money, so can I just take it out of the box and have a look through? Take it out of the box, have a look through, go through all the same things that you've just done and make sure that that scope is good for you. If it's not quite as good, say to them, do you know what? I actually preferred the optics on your display model, if you're happy to have it, and take the display model. Um, I've actually done that in a shop before, and I bought the display model because it was considerably better than the one in the box. Um, so that's a couple of little tips and tricks uh, to get the best optics for your money. I just shot a target at 30 yards and I gave it half a mil dot of hold over. So what are the different reticules? Should we have a 30-30 rep? What is a 30-30 rep? Multi-aim point. There are many different types. Back to Gary in the conservatory and he will explain all about it. You know this hasn't got a pellet in it. Oh, and I still knocked it over. Impressive. Okay, one of the most important things about a telescopic sight is the reticule. Now, in the old days, you had something like this. Now, this is what is known as a duplex ret, 30-30 ret. 
standard crosshair ret. Um, you will see these on hunting scopes. Um, they're quite common. You don't really see them in target shooting that much. There are a few people use them, but this is what most people know as a reticule on a telescopic sight. Now, we moved on from this duplex ret to this. Now, this is a MILDOT ret. Now, MILDOT stands for milliradian. Um, now, as you can see, it's a standard duplex ret, but we also have dots. These are one mil dot spaced apart. And the advantage with mil dots is you can now use them to range find targets. Now, this is a standard mil dot rep, one mil dot uh, each, each space, as I've just said. So if you've got a, say, a 35 millimeter target of 40 yards, you put the crosshair at the bottom of the kill zone. And if it's just touching that, then you know it's a 35 millimeter at 40 yards. You can use these to range find. Now, these are the full mil dots, but you can also get a half mil dot ret. And what that is, is it's your standard mil dot ret, but you will have little slashes in between, half mil dot. Now, the advantage with this is I know that a 40, 25 millimeter target of 40 yards is half a mil dot. So website. I can measure. Now, moving on from the half mil dot reticule, you've got this. Now, this is the reticule that I shoot with. This is the MH10 um, from Optisan. And you'll see here, obviously, we've got up and down full mil dots and half mil dots side to side, which you'd also get with the Hawk Tac 30. But also, you've got these little dots here as well. And these are your windage. And I think these are like 10 mile an hour increments. So if you've got a say a 10 mile an hour wind coming from right to left, you're shooting a 40 yard target. Then you want to go over to this dot just on the right hand side. You obviously you still shoot it at your 40 yards, but that will give you 10 mile an hour, 20 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour. So it will give you a rough idea of how much off you need to shoot. So this is the MH10 or is it ML10? I can never remember. MH10. Um, this is a superb reticule, which I, I really enjoy. Getting a good ret and learning your reticule, and that's, again, one of the main advantages with shooting on a fixed magnification, is you get to learn when you look through your scope. You think, okay, that's that's right at uh, that distance. So I, I put my crosshairs on the bottom, and it's the, the top of the kill zone is just bleeding out the top of the half mil dot slash, so that's probably 33 yards. And it's doing things like this that will help you improve your score. Mounts are incredibly important. We just don't want to gaffer tape our scopes to the top of our guns. And you have two choices. You can either go for the sports match or you can go for BKLs. Both mounting systems are absolutely superb. Um, there are many others out there, but I have not used them personally. I use sports match or BKLs and there are different heights, different types, but Gary will explain more. All right, so one of the most important things, apart from the gun and your scope, is how we attach our telescopic sight to our rifle. Now, there are two main manufacturers that are predominantly used within HFT. If you're out on the course, what you'll see is you'll see either a BKL or you will see a sports match. Now, BKLs are a very popular scope mount. Um, BKL mounts, as you can see here, they're like double strap. One there, one there, one there, one there. Um, very, very good mount. Sports match. These are slightly different. They don't come in the double strap. They just come in the single piece across there. Um, and they're a superb mount. I've used sports match myself for years. I'm a big fan of them. Um, you can also buy different types of, of mount. You can buy, now these are a medium mount, you can go for a high mount, or you can go for a super high mount. Um, you can also go for a one-piece mount, and that is essentially very similar to this, but it has got a solid bar which goes across here with the mounts fixed either side. You can also buy a damper mount, which has got a certain amount of recoil built in, which they recommend for springers. And you can also buy an adjustable mount where you will centralize the scope and then you adjust the mount and not the scope. 
Um, um, I know. But I'll be honest with you, for me, I've never, uh, I own a lot of springers. I've never used damper mounts. Um, I've never used adjustable mounts. I use good old fashioned medium mounts from Sports Match or BKL, and I've never had an issue on any of my so guns. Stick with your now, medium mounts. Try and get your objective lens as close to the barrel as you possibly can. That will help reduce error with cant. Um, obviously, if you've got a big objective lens like the 60 millimeter we looked at uh, earlier on, you're going to need a super high mount. Something like this little Optus Hand CP, you need a medium mount. Um, but if you're going to go online, go to a reputable dealer, someone like JS Rams Bottoms. Um, the Air Gun Center in Rayleigh has got a great online store, so is Solware. Um, and actually, if you're going to go for Optics, Optics Warehouse, they have got a massive selection of scopes, and they're really helpful. And if you're not sure, give them a call and have a chat. Um, they won't put you wrong. Um, so that's about it for mounts and for scopes and, and bits like that. So we're going to go on to Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's video, and hopefully I've been able to explain a little bit more about telescopic sights. As ever, a huge thanks to everyone who's helped me out with the video and has lent me kit to use. Huge thanks to Jacobson Lockett for lending me that FT gun. Really is appreciated. Um, do me a favour, please like, share and subscribe. It really does help the channel. Um, also, I've got a favour to ask. Um, I've had an uh, email from one of our viewers. Uh, he sent an email to lifeattherange at gmail.com. Uh, we also now have a Facebook page, uh, Life at the Range, which come and join, and a website, lifeattherange.com. Um, he asked me to do a one, two, three of gun safety. Um, now, I've been shooting for quite a long time, but I've, I admit I've forgotten stuff and things like that. So if there is anything you can think of that you would like me to add in the video that you think is a good practice for gun safety, please put it in the comments below or drop me an email. And if you'd like me to put a photograph of you up, add that to the email and I'll happily, uh, I'll happily include it in the video. So that's it for today. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Take care, shoot straight, stay safe. Thank you from Life at a Range. Ta-da.